Baptist Church. Glad to have you out here with us today and appreciate you taking time to out of your week and coming to be here to worship the Lord. A lot of other things you could have been doing and you decided to be here with us and I'm glad for that. I appreciate you doing that and uh, glad to see Earl and Jessica are still alive. We <laughs> we've had a few in quarantine and we've got a few others this morning in quarantine and uh, so we, we just so that's just kind of part of life these days we're having to deal with it but we're doing the best we can uh just pray for each other pray that everybody stays healthy and uh pray that uh pray that we're able to just continue serving the lord during all this there are, are a lot of people that need jesus and we need to tell them so continue to try to serve the lord faithfully during this time as well all right well thank you for being here today and being part of that faithfulness if you would do me a favor, now Earl and Jessica will give you a pass here, all right? But if, uh, if you are a guest, if this is your first time or maybe your first time in a real long time, uh, there should be a card in front of you there. And uh, if you would, if you would fill that out, take time during the service, fill that out, then uh, you can either drop that in the offering plate or you can take it back to our visitor's center, which is out, in, out, outside these doors right here on your way out. Uh, you can drop that by the visitor center. If you do that, they'll have a gift for you when you get there. So if you'll fill that card out and then take that to the visitor center and let them have that. That way we know who you are. We don't miss anybody. I would appreciate you doing that this morning and taking the time to do that. But whether you are a guest, whether this is your first time or your thousand and first time, we're glad to have you with us here today. Thank you for coming. Let's just continue to serve Jesus Christ together this morning. Let me mention a couple of things. I have to mention a couple of reminders on Sunday mornings. Uh, you've probably maybe already noticed this. A lot of times in years past, we would have Christmas card exchanges. We would maybe have a box. We've done a few different ways. Have a box out here. We'd have our youth hand those out here at church. We would do different, different ways of doing that. We're not going to do that this year. For a lot of reasons, one of the reasons is where we're not walking around handing each other stuff we you know we don't take an offering up for that same reason we try not to pass things around so we're not going to be doing that this year the other thing is there are a lot of people that are normally here that are not this time and so because we don't know who's going to be here and who's not going to be here we'd rather you not leave things laying in the pews during the weeks like that so uh, if you this year if you got a christmas card you're going to have to mail it uh, you can call Mary Lynn, she'll get you an address if you need one from somebody, but you're just going to have to mail them this year, just uh, sort of the nature of things. So keep that in mind. Uh, there, uh, as a matter of fact, we have some addresses out here for our Golden Agers and our Homebound. So if you are inclined to send people a card, we have some addresses out here in the foyers of some of our Golden Agers, some of those that are homebound, who really probably would appreciate a card this time of year. So if you want to send a card, stop and pick up those addresses on your way out, and you can send those to some of our church members that are at home, not able to get out. Uh, be placing poinsettias for Christmas season next Sunday morning. So if you want to make sure that you get one, you need to have a name or names, plural, of the people that you're honoring, remembering, and uh, you can give those. Uh, you can, those can be dropped off in the nursery hall at any time during the week, or you can bring them with you next Sunday morning. 
So if you have a poinsettia, you can bring it any time during the week. Bring it next Sunday morning. Make sure there's a card in there with the name on it in honor or in memory of somebody. So uh, if you want to do that, you can. If you can make those not real, if you can make those artificial plants, that's always good. We have some people that have trouble with breathing problems, and those real plants give them some allergy problems or breathing problems or whatever you want to call it. So if you can get a fake one, that's, that's better to so do that. Fake one. That sounds real nice, doesn't it? Get a fake one. All right. Anything else that I need to mention if I've remembered all my notes here? All right. Well, one other thing here then. Let's have a good time worshiping Jesus together today. All right? Elijah, would you come and lead us in some songs? All right. Before we get started, we'll do birthdays and anniversaries. Anybody? Oh, I'm going to have to go all the way to the back. Is this anniversary? <laughs> Anybody else? Hey. Kevin oh, hey. Yeah. <laughs> They're also still alive. Yeah, yeah. that's good. <laughs> anniversary. All right. Awesome. Is this your first anniversary? Two. Two. Two Second. Long yeah. Two, <laughs> two long <laughs> ones. Two long ones. Already? Anybody else? Y'all pray for Seth. Nobody else? <laughs> yeah. Somebody might have to give some money to Kaylin here. Anybody? Uh, wait, wait, I think I got I think I got a dollar. Krista gave me a dollar last night. <laughs> there we go. This will be your birthday money. All right. <laughs> we'll we'll get started. Uh, we're going to be on number 495. There's a land that's fairer than day. In your Baptist hymnal. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way. To prepare us a dwelling place there In the sweet, in the sweet by and by, by, by We shall meet on that beautiful shore by by, In the sweet, in the sweet by, by, and by, by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore we shall sing on that beautiful shore The melodious songs of the blessed And our spirit shall sorrow no more Not a sigh for the blessing of rest In the sweet, In the sweet by and by, by, and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore turn over to number 63 now and if everybody can and will please stand I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could lie Condemned unclean. How oh, marvelous, how oh, wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How oh, marvelous, how oh, wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was 
sometimes are hard for a lot of us, especially if we have loved ones that have gone on, in which I do. And um, I like to think, and, and when I get down, this is my song I listen to to help lift my spirits because it talks about heaven and who we're going to see there. And uh, I'm just so thankful that I know where I'm going when I leave this world. Had a vision of heaven, what these eyes they did see, as I viewed way up yonder in the sweet eternity. I thought I entered that city and I stopped at the gate so anxious to enter I could hardly wait as I neared that city Jesus stood at the door said my child enter in you are safe forevermore want to walk all around to see who I could see for I had so many loved ones who came ahead of me Walked on a little farther Who is that I did see Why that's the little old lady Who many times befriended me Helped me in my sickness And in trouble a helping hand Why that's her there is singing In the blessed angel band Walked on a little farther Who is that I did see? Why, that's Dad and Mama Who were just 
ahead of me I wonder will they know me They have been gone so long with a smile They remember, said my child, you're welcome home Walked on a little farther Who is that I did see? Why that's the old beggar Who sat upon the street But he looks so different Sitting there around God's throne I can still hear him a singing While the ages roll on Oh yes, over yonder is a face I remember still It's the old-fashioned preacher From the church up on the hill With his Bible I still see him Standing there so many times Telling us about this heaven That someday I'm gonna call mine But I must keep on walking So many faces more so many more faces that I am searching for But I won't have to hurry I'll take all the time I need For I'm here forever through all eternity started here, I'm going to ask Porky to lead us in prayer while I can put on my microphone. Because I forgot to put on my microphone. When I, when I get one of them, uh, when I get to pastor one of them big churches with that big TV ministry, you know, like them guys on TV do, I'm going to hire me a guy that just follows me around and makes me put a microphone on all the time. I'm, I'm going to have a personal microphone assistant when I get big time one of these days. Well, of course, then I'll have a big TV ministry. Y'all will see me driving around in my stretched Cadillac and everything. I, yeah, and I, I won't even be able to talk to you all. I'll be too important by that point. So I won't even be able to talk to the rest of you. Porky, would you lead us in a word of prayer, brother? All right, I got it going, Jordan. All right, very good. Turn with me to Luke chapter 18. And while you're turning to Luke 18, 31, let me share with you a personal dilemma. There's a lot of times uh, here when I'm preaching, you know, it's hard on your voice, and so I'll uh, get a water or something and drink water. But I'm up here preaching, and so I don't, I'm, often I don't finish the water. And now I have two half-empty waters right here, and I'm not sure if one of them's mine or both of them's mine or neither of them's mine, and I don't know if I should try drinking one of them or not. Huh? Is mine? That's yours. That's yours. Right? Okay. Well, you got the Rona for sure. I ain't drinking that. All right. So I, I'm going to... Y'all pray for me this morning. Things ain't going well. Luke chapter 18, verse 31. All right, well, I will not drink either of those then, Elijah. I'll just not take any chances. Now, I'm going to read you verses 31 through 34, and then we're going to read the two stories that follow that as we go. And You may think that those stories are unrelated to the verses we're reading and unrelated to each other, but they're not. And I, by the end of this sermon, I hope that you can see exactly 
what Jesus wants us to see out of this passage and out of these stories that we're going to read here this morning. All right, Luke chapter 18, verse 31. Last couple of Sundays, we last few Sundays, we've been looking at a series called On the Road Again. And we've been looking at different roads. We've looked at the Wilderness Way in Exodus 13. We've looked at uh, the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9 and the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. Well, here is the Jericho Road in Luke chapter 18. Not the only time Jericho is mentioned, certainly, but one of the times that it's mentioned, the Jericho Road, verse 31 of Luke 18. Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and, spite, and spitefully entreated and spit it on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. And they understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them, them neither knew they the things which were spoken. Would you all pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the chance to be here today to worship together and to praise Your name. Father, we thank You for Your Word and Your Spirit. Lord, we thank You that we don't have to pray You down, that You're already here, already here amongst us. And Father, I pray that You just continue to do a work that only You can do, that You would change our hearts, change our minds, change our lives, make us more like Jesus, less like the old person we used to be. And if there's somebody here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of their life, I pray that today will be that day that they would give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. Thank you for all the things you've done, and all the things you're going to do, but above all things, thank you for Jesus. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Uh, whenever I was a kid, uh, Mom took us to the, to the birthplace of Helen Keller. She was born June 27, 1880 in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Mom took us there and we got to view that area. She was 19 months old. She contracted an unknown illness. They weren't sure exactly what it was. They thought it may be, looking back later, medical experts think it could have been scarlet fever or possibly meningitis, but they don't know for sure what it was. They do know the effects from that illness. At 19 months old, she, she uh, had an illness. It made her both deaf and blind. And here's the way she described it. She lived from that moment on. She says, she lived at, at sea in a dense fog. Not being able to hear, not being able to see. And life was to her, as she described it, she was at sea in a dense fog. Now, Helen Keller's breakthrough in communication came from somebody who was brought in specifically to work with her, Ann Sullivan. She came in and began to teach her sign language. She would hold out Helen Keller's hand and she would spell out the names of objects that she would then place in her hand. And Keller was very frustrated. She had no idea what in the world was going on, what that meant, what was happening. One day she was trying to learn how to spell mug. And Ann Sullivan was trying to teach her the word mug and spelling it out in her hand and a mug in one hand and she became so frustrated that she just smashed the mug. She didn't know what any of those words were. She didn't know what the letters meant. She didn't know anything about it until one day, as water was running over one hand and her teacher spelled the word water in the other hand. And she said, a light came on. And for the first time in her life, she understood that the letters W-A-T-R, wait, 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 W-A-T-E-R, <laughs> W-A-T-E-R meant the wonderful, cool thing that was flowing over my hand in her own words here. She said this, the living word awakened my soul, gave it light, Hope set it free. She was blind, 
and death. But for the first time in her life, she could experience the world around her because of language and learning. In a sense, she could see. Not physically, but she was able to experience and interact with the world around her in a way that she had never been able to do before. And if you know anything about the life of Helen Keller, she later learned to speak audibly. She was a prolific writer, wrote numerous books, numerous articles. She went and gave speeches, very uh, inspiring speeches all around, raised money for uh, deaf and blind schools throughout her work as well, did a lot of work for a lot of people along the way and was very inspiring with her life. Now, I tell you all that story to to tell you another story that we're going to read about today. Because verse 31 says this, And he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. So, they're traveling to Jerusalem first. That's where they're going. That's always been where Jesus was going, Jerusalem. And everything else that we see in Luke is leading up to that culminating event. It is leading up to Jesus going to Jerusalem. And He tells them now why He's going to Jerusalem. That's always been the destination. But He tells them why. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished, for He shall be delivered unto the Gentiles. He shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, and spit it on. They shall scourge Him and put Him to death. And the third day He shall rise again. Jesus predicts His death. He also predicts His resurrection. And He even says there that this is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. The Bible prophesied that these things would happen hundreds of years before they happened. And then verse 34 says this, And they understood none of these things. So the destination has always been Jerusalem. Always. And the reason he's going to Jerusalem is because he's going to die there. And he says that the Bible prophesied these events hundreds of years before they ever actually happened. You read about these in the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament. And I don't have time to preach that whole sermon today, but God slaughtered an animal to cover the sinfulness and the nakedness of Adam and Eve. And the Bible pictured that and prophesied that from there on. Whenever um, Abraham raised a knife to slay his son Isaac, God provided a ram of sacrifice. That's a picture of Jesus. When the priests would uh, slay that goat and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant there in the temple, that was a picture of Jesus who was to come, who was going to forgive the sins of the world. When Isaiah says, He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. By His stripes we are healed. That is a prophecy about Jesus who was to come. And there are numerous other examples in the Old Testament that picture a suffering servant, Jesus Christ, who was going to come, die, and rise again for the sins of the world. The Old Testament prophesied about it. Jesus told them about it. And they didn't understand a word of it. They're blind. I don't mean physically blind. I mean spiritually to the truth that's going on. They didn't have a clue spiritually about what was happening around them. Verse 35 then says this, And it came to pass that as He was come nigh unto Jericho, so before we get to Jerusalem, we're going to Jericho. The Jericho Road. Now there are two events that happen. One in Luke 18 and the next one in Luke 19. And you are familiar, if you've been in church much, you're familiar with both of these events. One of them is the healing of a blind man. The other is the story about Zacchaeus. Do you all know anything about Zacchaeus? Of course you do. If you grew up in church, you do anyway, because you're singing that song in your head right now, aren't you? If you know something about Zacchaeus, he was a wee little man. That's what you were thinking, wasn't it? Well, before we get to Zacchaeus... Let's listen about Bartimaeus. Verse 35 says this, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. Now, Mark tells us that the man's name was Bartimaeus. Bar meaning son of, and Timaeus meaning his dad's name was Timaeus. So this is the son of Timaeus. That's that's how how he was known to us in Mark, Bartimaeus. Luke doesn't tell us his name, but certainly tells us his situation. He's a blind man sitting by the roadside begging. Verse 36, Hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. Now, this makes sense to you, doesn't it? 
there's a commotion, and he's blind, and he doesn't know what the commotion is. It reminds me of one of my favorite movies. It's a Robert Redford movie called Sneakers. It's an older movie, but it's a group of guys who are sort of on the outs with the law, but they use their skills and talents and abilities to make a little bit of money anyway, and they break into banks and things like that and show them where their weaknesses are. Well, at one point, a man is in a trunk, and he is, it's completely dark, and he's describing to those, these other guys the sounds that he heard along the way, the bridge that he hears, the thump, thump, thump as they cross a bridge. The sound of a party turns out to be a bunch of birds. And so he's describing all these sounds to them. And one of the men who's in the group is blind, and he is translating these sounds into sights and actual things that you would see. He translates those things for them because he'd been blind all his life and he was used to sound. Here's a man that's born blind. He hears the sounds, but he can't see the scene. And so he asks somebody around him, hey, what's happening? What's going on here? Verse 37, And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by, and he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace, but he cried, So much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. So here's the scene. He hears that it's Jesus coming, and he begins to make a commotion himself. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet. Hush up. Leave him alone. You're disrupting things. You're causing a problem. Be quiet over there. He's just an old stupid, silly beggar. Tell that beggar to be quiet. But instead of being quiet, he cries out all the more. That means louder. So they tell him to be quiet, and he gets louder. I have a joke to alienate half of the crowd here. Um, and so bear with me. Uh, and forgive me for telling this joke. I just always think it's funny. Telling this guy to be quiet. You know what that's like? That's tell, like telling a woman to calm down. Okay, let's move on here. We... <laughs> all right, all right. Sorry, Kristen. Well, they tell this guy to be quiet. And you know what his response is? He gets louder. He doesn't, he doesn't quieten down. Because he's not there for this crowd. They certainly weren't there for him. He's not there for the crowd. He's not crying to the crowd. He's crying out to Jesus. And he says, Son of David, have mercy on me! Somebody tells him about Jesus. And he cries out to him. And they tell him to be quiet. And he cries out louder. And his cry is something interesting. Not just Jesus. Jesus, thou son of David. Now, why would he say, Jesus, thou son of David? Did he know the family lineage of Jesus Christ? Had he read Matthew chapter 1? Folks, I hate to tell you this, but Matthew chapter 1 wasn't around at this time. Matthew hadn't written it yet. He hadn't read about the lineage of Jesus. He didn't know for sure who he had descended from. This is not a statement about the heritage and the lineage of Jesus specifically as much as it is a statement about the promises of God. When he calls him the son of David, he is claiming here a royal priesthood, a royal lineage of Jesus Christ. Let me, let me tell you, uh, give you some homework here. 2 Samuel chapter 7. You can go home and read the whole chapter. But verse 16 says this. 2 Samuel 7, 16. This is God speaking to King David, and he says this, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Here's the promise that God made to David. There's going to be one who will rule and reign on the throne of David in Jerusalem and Israel, and he will do so forever. Now that certainly wasn't Solomon. Solomon died. He ruled all his life, but he died. And eventually, that kingdom was overthrown and nobody from a 
descendancy of David that was ruling on the throne of Israel. And at this time, nobody from the lineage of David is ruling on the throne of Israel. As a matter of fact, Israel isn't even in charge of itself. Right now, Rome had conquered Israel and they were in charge of everything. So when he is saying this, what he is claiming is this, that Jesus is the fulfillment of Almighty God, that one day someone would rule and reign forever. And this blind man says, that is Jesus. Now, do you get the scene here? The verse we started off, Jesus said, the Old Testament prophesied it, and I'm fixing to fulfill it. I'm going to Jerusalem. They're going to treat me terribly. They're going to beat me. They're going to spit upon me. They're going to crucify me. And then I'm going to rise again. The Old Testament prophesied it. He told His disciples that. And the Bible says, they didn't understand a word of it. So here are these people that can see, and they don't know who Jesus is. Now we have this man that is blind, and he sees exactly who Jesus is. He takes an Old Testament prophecy, and he applies it to Jesus Christ. His disciples couldn't do that, and this blind man did. He sees exactly who Jesus is. He knew exactly why Jesus came. Maybe he didn't understand everything about Jesus, but he certainly understood a lot more than Jesus' own disciples did. So Jesus responds to him, verse 41, saying, What wilt thou I shall do unto thee? (laughs) So this blind man is calling out to Jesus, this blind beggar, Have mercy on me! Son of David, have mercy on me! And Jesus comes over and says, What do you want me to do for you? Now doesn't that seem maybe to you like a silly question for Jesus to ask? What do you want me to do for you? I'm pretty sure Jesus knew what this guy wanted. Let me rephrase that. Jesus knew exactly what this guy wanted. But you know in the Bible, the Lord asks us questions in Scripture a lot of times, not because God wants to know, but because He wants us to know. One of the first questions, the first question that God ever asks is this. Adam, where are you? Adam was hiding. You remember the story in Genesis 3? Adam was hiding because he had sinned. And now he and Eve are hiding out because they had sinned and they are naked. And God says, where are you? Now God knew exactly where Adam was. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly where I am. God knows everything. And He knew where Adam was. He didn't ask that question because he didn't know where Adam was. He wanted Adam to know where Adam was. For the first time in his life, Adam was hiding from God. And Adam needed to know where he was and why. And Jesus asked this question for the exact same reason. Jesus knew what this guy wanted, but this guy needs to know what he wants and why. So verse 41, saying, What wilt thou I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people when they saw it gave praise unto God. It's interesting Jesus' response. He doesn't say, Your faith has given you sight. He says, Your faith has saved you. Jesus understood this, and this man understood this, that this receiving of his physical sight had a lot more to do with him spiritually than it had to do with him physically. He received his sight, but he received his salvation. He received eternal life because he had placed his trust in Jesus Christ. He trusted that Jesus was good enough to give him physical sight, but this man also trusted that Jesus was good enough to save him. He knew that there was more to Jesus than just receiving his eyesight. Sometimes on Sunday mornings when I pray before I preach, you'll hear me say this, Lord, give us spiritual ears to hear and spiritual eyes to see and a spiritual heart to receive it. You hear me pray that sometimes, and there's a reason I pray that. It's because in and of ourselves, 
we don't understand spiritual things. We need the Holy Spirit of God to convict us, to convince us, to draw us, to open our eyes to spiritual truths. It's not that we can't understand the words. It's that the meaning makes no sense to us apart from God working in our lives. We need Jesus. This blind man needed Him. His disciples needed Him. And Zacchaeus did too. Listen to verse 1 of the next chapter. Verse 19, chapter 19, verse 1 says this, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Behold, there was a certain man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was of little stature. He was a short guy. But there's more to this than just that. Zacchaeus couldn't see Jesus. You see the pattern? His disciples couldn't see Him, not for who He really was. This blind man who couldn't see physically did see Jesus for who He was. And now here's Zacchaeus who once again cannot see. He is physically unable to see, but he is spiritually blind to who Jesus is right now. There's a picture being painted in Luke about who Jesus is and why He came. He's going to Jerusalem, and He's going there to suffer, to bleed, to die, and to rise again. And if you can see that, you can be saved and made whole. And if you cannot see that, there is no hope for you, no matter what, how good your eyesight is. And so Zacchaeus can't see. He's a little guy. He can't see anything. Verse 4, he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree for to see him. Now you know that part of the sycamore. Y'all are just singing along while I'm reading this story to you, aren't you? Climbed up in a sycamore tree. For he was going to pass that way. Verse 5, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for today. I must abide at thy house. For I'm going to your house today. That's the song. All right. Verse 6, he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Received him joyfully. Do you notice the response of the blind man? Verse 43, and immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people when they saw him. There's more to this than just receiving his physical eyesight. He has received Jesus Christ spiritually for who he is. And now we see Zacchaeus who can't see Jesus, but then Jesus says, I'm going to your house, and he receives him joyfully. There's a lot more going on here than just Zacchaeus having a meal with Jesus. He has received him joyfully for who he is and for why he came. Verse 7 says this, And when they saw it, so here's some people who can see. They can see physically, and they see what's going on. When they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Jesus is eating with sinners. You ever, uh, you ever let that thought cross through your mind? Maybe you don't say it exactly that way. But you say things like, Well, I don't have anything to do with him. That guy's worthless. Well, she's trash. I wouldn't give her the time of day. We dismiss other people because we think that they are less than us or beneath us or not good enough for our time. Jesus did not do that, but a lot of other people did. Zacchaeus wasn't just small in stature. In their eyes, he was small in importance. They could see physically, but they had no idea why Jesus really came. No, to them, Jesus didn't come for sinners. Jesus came for real spiritual people like me. They were. This is the crowd that's following Jesus and enamored with Him. And they think that they're good, and they think that Jesus came for those good people. He's one of them. Because they're good and Jesus is good. They think they're good enough. Everybody look up here and listen for just a second. You can quit listening again after that, alright? Listen for just a second. Jesus cannot help those who think they're already good enough. And these people were too blind to see it. Not Zacchaeus. He couldn't see, but he climbed up in a tree. Jesus came to him, came to his house. 
And he had a meal with a, with a sinner. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Because the Lord, uh, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Now, I want to stop there and say this. Zacchaeus isn't saved because he gave money to poor people. Zacchaeus gave money to poor people because he's saved. Do you understand the difference? He is not doing this to get saved. He's doing this as a result of being saved. Let me explain it this way. You don't come to God and say, Lord, I'm going to clean up my act. I'm going to do right and believe right and live right. And whenever I get all the sin out of my life and get my life straight, then I'll come to you for salvation. That's not how it works. You come to God for salvation, and then God gets your life straightened out. He fixes you and molds you and, and shapes you and makes you, not the other way around. You don't come to God worthy to enter into His presence. God comes to you, saves you through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and makes you worthy to enter into His presence, not because you are good enough, but because Jesus is good enough. It is exactly the opposite of what a lot of people think. He didn't give money to the poor to get saved. He gave money to the poor because He's saved. Verse 9, Jesus reveals that to us. Verse 9 and 10. Jesus said to them, This day is salvation come to this house. Here's what happens. When you get saved, Jesus Christ opens your spiritual eyes and heals those spiritually deaf ears and gives you a spiritual heart to receive His truth. And you are saved you're given new, spiritual, eternal life. And when you get saved, you get changed. Jesus changes you from the inside out, and people start to see on the outside what Jesus does on the inside. Lazarus got saved, and immediately he starts living that out by giving away his money. You see, money had meant everything to Lazarus. It had been a god to him. He was a tax collector, which means he was a thief. He stole from people. He would send Rome the taxes, but then he would charge a lot more and pocket the rest. He was a thief, and most people thought he was a thief and a traitor too, because he worked for Rome. So they considered him a thief and a traitor, and it's pretty obvious from his response that he really was a thief. It wasn't just a rumor. This wasn't just a, uh, a speculation. He actually was a thief. And when Jesus became His God instead of money, what happened was He took that thing that used to be a God to Him and He got rid of it. Verse 9, Jesus said, And this day is salvation come to this house, for as much as He also is the Son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's the Son of Abraham too. He's not a traitor. He's not scum. He's not beneath you, beneath me. He certainly wasn't beneath Jesus Christ. He's the Son of Abraham, a child of God. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. This section that I read here, we start in chapter 18, we end in chapter 19. We start with Jesus telling us where He's going, why He's going, and what's going to happen. He's going to Jerusalem, He's going to suffer, bleed, and die, He's going to rise from the dead, and He's going to do so because God predicted and prophesied that would happen. He was going to die for the sins of the world. And it ends with Him saying, here's why I came. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And in between all of that, we have all these people that have spiritual eyesight or don't. These people who have physical eyesight and, or don't. But all of these people coming to realize who Jesus was and why He came. Disciples have no idea why He came. This blind man, Bartimaeus, sees straight to the heart of Jesus, the son of David. Here's Zacchaeus who can't see a thing shorter than everybody else around him, less than everybody else around him, and Jesus comes to his house because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, for you and me, that means first of all we have to know Jesus. Who He is and why He came called salvation. So that's the way we describe it at church here. Jesus left the splendor and the glory of heaven where He was worshipped, served, and adored. He came to this earth. He was born a special, unique birth, a virgin birth. He lived a special, unique life. 
He lived a sinless life. Something you and I couldn't do, Jesus did. And then He died on the cross in a special, unique death. He died in your place and in my place. He died for your sins and for my sins. And on the third day, He rose from the dead, victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave. Jesus Christ will save anyone who comes to Him. He will give you His righteousness, and He takes your sinfulness. And you can be saved. That's why Jesus came to save. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. But now listen, that's not the end. That's just the beginning. See, when you get saved, Jesus changes you from the inside out. And you need to start living for Jesus Christ and serving Jesus Christ. You need to understand why Jesus came. And you need to live out that mission in your life as well. You and I need to be telling people about Jesus and sharing Jesus and living for Jesus. And and the responses that Jesus got out of this blind man out of Zacchaeus should be the responses He gets from us. We should want to serve Him and glorify, glorify Him and give Him away the riches that we have not just physically, but spiritually. Give the riches of Jesus Christ away to all those who need it. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why He came. Christian, does your life reflect that to the world around you? If people look at the way you live and talk and act and think and believe, would they see Jesus who came to save them? Would they hear Jesus who came to save them? Is your life mission the same as the mission of Jesus Christ? If not, something's wrong. I don't know what decision you need to make here this morning. Maybe you have never been saved and you want to do that. I want to pray a prayer this morning. And that whether you're here in person or maybe you're watching this online, if you want to be saved, you want to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and be the Lord of your life, you can do that right here, right now, today. I'm going to pray a prayer, and you just pray this prayer along with me. I'm going to pray it out loud. You pray it silently, you and the Lord. If you pray this prayer, you mean this prayer, you're sincere in this prayer, you will be saved. The prayer goes like this. Jesus, I know I have sinned. I believe You died for my sins. I want You to save me from my sins. I want You to forgive me. I turn from my sins and I turn to You. I want You to be the Lord of my life. Thank You, Jesus, for saving me. Now help me to live for You. Amen. If you prayed that prayer here this morning, or maybe you're watching online, you prayed that prayer, will you let me know that? Contact me, let me know. If you're here, you can walk down this aisle and let me know about that this morning. If you're watching this online, contact me, contact our office, let me know about that decision. I want to talk with you, I want to pray with you, I want to talk to you about how to live for Jesus in this life and how to walk with Him in the life to come. Let me know about that decision. Maybe some other decision you need to make here this morning. Maybe you've been saved and you want to repent of your sins and rededicate your life to Jesus. Or maybe you want to join our church. Or maybe you have been saved and you haven't followed the Lord in baptism and you want to do that. Maybe you just need to be praying at this altar or maybe some other decision. Whatever decision you need to make, if the Lord is speaking to your heart, if there's a decision you need to make, would you come?